Thank you so much for coming out, and, and thank you so much for having me here. Uh, we've got a, an incredible panel of guests that I will be speaking to afterwards, and we'll be interviewing them. Um, it, it is an amazing thing that, you got, that everyone is here, and we have some very serious issues that we need to discuss, particularly with the current treatment and, and, and challenges facing refugees and asylum seekers in Australia. One of the things I want to address up front is, I, while I will be speaking on these issues, and, and, and the panel over here that we will have later will also be talking about that. I myself am not a refugee or asylum seeker, um, or I wasn't at least when I first came to Australia. Uh, things have changed a bit since then, I'll get into that really quickly. Um, I, I actually, I came here in 2012, and as of January 26th, 2017, which is this January, I became an Australian citizen, uh, which was very exciting. Thank you very much. No, I, it was... Um, it was a big deal for me because uh, it, it, it's a, it takes a while to kind of get that. And I first began the application process of coming to Australia in 2009 from Pakistan. And uh, we applied in 2009. And the Department of Immigration quickly processed our paperwork three and a half to four years later. And, and we finally came here. And, and it's a long journey. And, 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 and I was excited about the citizenship thing because I went for the citizenship test in November of last year. Uh, anyone here taken the test before? Yeah, you've taken the test, you've taken the test. Oh, when did you take it, sir? Oh, no, when, sorry. 2012, okay, and uh, it's, it, it's, I think it's the same test back then as the one I've taken now, in that it's mostly uh, bureaucratic questions, right? It's questions about like government and the way, this, the, way the Australian Commonwealth is distributed and, and the way rules are made in Parliament and things like that. And now they're talking about changing that test because they're, tr they're talking about making it more difficult and, 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 and you know, making it about more challenging things they feel is too easy. And I think the message whenever they do that is that we w we're going to make the test more difficult so that less immigrants can come in from developing nations, from third world countries and things like that. And that's all. Whenever they make things more difficult, it's to keep us out. And I think that works against them because what they don't realize is that people from developing nations we are nerds. We love working hard. Are you kidding me? I get to study even harder for the test now? Can I take it again? Like, that's so exciting, right? So like that, the only thing that ends up happening is the Brits and the Americans can't get citizenship, which is fine. That's all right. We have enough. Um, and so I went for the test, and I did that, and I passed that. And then, they, then I got a call from the Department of Immigration, and they said, we would like you to attend the citizenship ceremony. So you, went to, you, you did the ceremony as well, after the test, in Melbourne as well? At the MCG or where? Uh, Sorry? Sunshine. Sunshine. Okay, so in your town council, basically. I, um, I would have been in Moreland Council, that's where I live. Um, and um, I was very excited about it. And then I got a call. Someone at the Department of Immigration realized that, oh, Sami Shah works at the ABC. And that's a nice story about an immigrant coming here and overcoming challenges and working for a national broadcaster, even though we make him take speech therapy lessons to get the brown out of his voice, which is a thing that happens. And, and so they, they, they're like, oh, you know, what we'll do is they called me up. And I had no idea, right? I had no idea that a call was coming. The phone rang one day. I'm excited. The citizenship ceremony is four days away. I'm looking forward to it. And I get a phone call, and they said, oh, this is the Department of Immigration. And I was like, oh, man, I was so close. What? <laughs> what did I do? And they're like, no, no, no. We want you to fly to Canberra, where the prime minister will make you a citizen, because they figure it's a nice photo opportunity. So they flew me to Canberra, and the prime minister, Malcolm Turnbull himself, made me a citizen, which means that I am more citizen than you. <laughs> I'm your, you don't get the perks I do. I get the secret room and everything. It's amazing. Um, the weirdest thing, though, was I felt like I let myself down. Because I'm a comedian. I'm, I'm a comedian, and, and comedians in our head, we're rock stars, we're rebels, we're rock and roll. And, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to stand up for what I believe in. I'm going to go there, I'm going to go to Canberra, I'm going to meet the Prime Minister. He's going to come up to me, and I'm going to shake his hand, and I'm going to be like, get them off Nauru, man. Like, something like that. And, and then I walked up to him, and he came up to me, and he stuck out his hand, and he said, nice to meet you, Sammy. And I said, thank you kindly. <laughs> Just sold out so hard. Such an embarrassment. 
But that's, so that's what happened now, is me becoming a citizen. It started in 2012, like I said. In 2009, actually, is when it really started. I was in Pakistan. I was born there. I grew up there. Um, and I realized it's time to leave because I got held up at gunpoint one day. Um, everyone in, I, I'm from a city called Karachi. Uh, Karachi is 26 million people. Um, and that's the entire population of Australia in one city. So when I first came to Australia and they were like, F off, we're full. I was like, full of what? Like, I don't, full of what? And no one would tell me. And, and then I, so a city of Karachi, 26 million people. And the way it works is everyone gets held up at gunpoint. Everyone. If you haven't been held up at gunpoint, it's because you're the guy holding the gun. That's the law there. And, and this, I was driving home one day. There's a knock on the window at a traffic light. I rolled down the window. This guy stuck a gun to my head and he said, give me a phone, give me a wallet. And I was like, oh, that's, you know, I should do that. So I, I look down, don't make eye contact, they shoot you. I look down, I give my phone and wallet. He took the phone and wallet and then he said, and I'll never understand why, but he did, he did this. He said, I hope you're not angry with me. <laughs> and, and I'm an idiot, right? I'm a comedian. I can't help the way my brain works. You should shut up at that point. But I panicked, and when I panic, I do stupid things. And I said, you've got my phone, you've got my wallet, leave me my anger. And he started laughing. And because he started laughing, I started laughing. We both started laughing. And, and, and then he stopped laughing. So I stopped laughing. And we looked at each other. And we kissed. No. Um, <laughs> sorry. I'm an idiot, sorry. Uh, no, what actually happened is even stranger, I promise. What actually happened is we looked at each other and he said he gave me the phone and wallet back. That's even stranger. And, and I was like, why are you doing this? And he said, look, this is what I have to do. If I don't do this, they kill me. But I'm not going to do this to you because you're a good guy. I can't do this to a good guy. And he walked away. It took me a long time to figure out what happened there. And I think what it is, is comedy broke the facade. There was a facade that had been created. He was a thief, I was a victim. And then we laughed, and laughed is a human reaction. And, and once you do that, you can't stop but seeing the other person as a human as well. So once he saw me as a human, he couldn't bring himself to do that to another human being. Either that, or he's the worst, worst judge of character ever. I don't know which one I prefer. But. So that happened, and, and, and I applied for migration. And I came to Australia on a work visa. I was hoping to move to Melbourne. Everyone's dream is to move to Melbourne. Everyone lives. I've been all over Australia. I don't know why there are other places. No one's told me yet why there's a Brisbane. It, I don't know, <laughs> but it is. Melbourne's amazing. And, and, and I was like, I want to live in Melbourne. But the Department of Immigration gave me a visa that's called a regional state-sponsored visa. What that does is it lets you live in Australia, but makes you first spend two years in a regional country town in Western Australia. And what that makes you feel like is it makes you feel like you're living in Australia, but also makes you feel like you never left a third world country in the first place. It just <laughs> eases you into the system. Like, I don't know what, how, but. So I ended up living in a small country town called Northam, uh, two hours away from Perth, little, almost two hours away from Perth. Um, and it was, it was actually lovely. It was beautiful. It was a small farming community. Um, I made friends there. I have lots of good friends there still. I settled in there. I ended up living there for four years. Uh, when I first moved there, they just opened up the Yonga Hill Immigration Detention Center. It was a massive detention center with refugees and asylum seekers from Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, Iran, countries like that, in that detention center, 600 of them. And me walking around town looking like this. And the first time I went to Woolies, they were like, oh my god, one of them got out! Like people, they actually called the cops on me twice while I was at Woolies. The second time I had to tell them, what do you think my grand plan to escape was? I will jump over the detention center walls and then come shopping at Woolworths? Like why would I do that? Like, so, just stop bothering me after that. This one woman came up to me, I'll never forget this, one woman came up to me and she goes, what if one of them escapes? This is when they didn't understand, right? They had no, she, she had no idea what was going on, who refugees were, what asylum seekers were. She only believed what she'd been told by the media. She's like, what if one of them escapes? What do we do? And that's when I, I realized Australians don't understand any of it. They haven't been told the truth. They haven't been told that these are good guys. These are doctors and lawyers and physicians and teachers and, and good guys escaping bad countries where the bad guys have won. 
That's what I, I couldn't explain to her until finally when she went, you know, what if one of them escapes, what do we do? I was like, I don't know, invite him in. He might teach you how to read and fix your teeth. I'd give that a shot, <laughs> something. So, so I lived there for four years, um, and then after four years, my permanent residency came up, and, and I finally got to move to Melbourne. And, and it was amazing, that when you move to Melbourne, people always tell you bizarre things. Um, you know you're moving to a good city because of what people warn you about. When you're moving to Bangkok, they say keep your money in the front pocket. When you move to New York, they say don't look up, they know you're a tourist. When you move to Melbourne, they say look out for the hook turn. I had no idea what a hook turn was. <laughs> For one year, I was frightened. And... <laughs> but I had, I had amazing experiences in WA, and, and, and I settled in there for a while, and, and I discovered the strange privileges to being alien, be, being so different from everyone else around you there. Um, I was in a town called Kalgoorlie. It's a small country town. It's, not, it's a mining town, really. Um, and I was there for a comedy show. And after the show finished, I was staying in a, an abandoned building that was owned by a pub that had now shut down and the old manager's room still had electricity. I'm a comedian, we get the fancy digs. And, and I stayed in this room and, and at night, all al alone in the building. And I went to sleep, it's a true story, you can look it up, it was in the local newspaper the next day. I went to sleep and I woke up at three o'clock in the morning and the door to my room was open. And I'm not scared of ghosts or anything, I'm from Pakistan, nothing scares me. So I was like, it's fine, whatever, I closed the door and I went back to sleep. And at five o'clock in the morning, two policemen kicked the door down. They have guns, they're yelling, get up, get up, get the hell up, get up. And I jump out of bed and I put on my glasses and it turns out someone had broken into the building at night, roamed around, triggered a silent alarm, and they thought I was the guy who broke in, changed into a night suit and went to bed. Like, I don't know what my <laughs> criminal plan was, but the cop asked me, he goes, who are you? What's your name? I was like, Samisha. He's like, where are you from? I was like, Pakistan. <laughs> where do you live? He's like, Northam. What do you do? I was like, comedian. <laughs> and I swear to God, the cop goes, I'm not doing this paperwork, you're free to go. And I was like, what a privilege. I can murder anyone now because they can't do the paperwork for it. It's too confusing for them. <laughs> but I, I, I had these, these bizarre moments and stuff, and uh, I got to travel Australia, and what I found was I used to do comedy in country towns across Australia, and, and I used to talk about refugee issues and things like that, and, and, and I didn't feel like I was making any difference because I was trying to communicate the challenges about, of being refugees and asylum seekers and all those things to audiences using comedy, and, and, and then I finally moved to Perth, and uh, moved to Melbourne, sorry, and, and I started doing this over here instead, and uh, it's been an interesting thing. Recently, something bizarre happened, though, so like I said, I'm not, I'm not a refugee, I'm not an asylum seeker, or I wasn't, um, and I've retroactively somehow become one. Um, I, I, I wrote a book called The Islamic Republic of Australia. Uh, I thought it was a funny title at the time. And uh, Pauline Hansen's not a fan of the book, it turns out. <laughs> she thought it was a how-to guide for some reason. It's just, it's a book about me, uh, you know, interviewing mu different Muslims from the Muslim community in Australia to see how, how they're facing the challenges of being in modern Australia and what they, what, you know, how they're dealing with it and all that. And anyway, it's, it's, it's there, it's, it, and, and the Daily Mail did a story on the book and they described me in the story. In, you know the Daily Mail, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's a very respected newspaper <laughs> of journalistic integrity. And, they described me as Sami Shah who fled Pakistan for blasphemy, which I didn't. I didn't flee. You can't flee over three and a half years of waiting for a visa. You, that's not how it works. I just migrated here. Um, and, and, and they described me inaccurately. And that story spread all the way to Pakistan. Um, and it turns out that in Pakistan, the Muslim community there, which is the whole country really, um, believes in three things. They believe in the Quran, they believe in the Hadith, which are the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, and they believe in the Daily Mail. And, and, and I started getting death threats, and I started getting all those things, and now I'm in the bizarrely unenviable position of becoming, I can't go back to Pakistan anymore, I've been told, it's not safe for me there. And I've become a refugee after becoming a citizen. 
But something strange started happening. I started getting all these abusive emails and threats and things. I'm used to those, by the way. I used to get them in Pakistan from the Taliban because I used to write articles. Um, the last one I got from the Taliban was four years ago. Um, I was on Twitter at night one day. I put out a tweet. The Taliban had threatened a TV station in Pakistan. And I put out a dumb tweet saying, uh, the Taliban is complaining about television like old people saying there's nothing good to watch these days. Just whatever. The spokesperson for the Taliban, this is a real thing, he's on Twitter. And he saw, I don't know why he saw that, but he saw that and he tweeted at me and said, yes, but our old people have exothermic reactions, which is a suicide bomber reference. And I tweeted back to him and I said, yes, but you haven't been around my grandfather when he has beans for breakfast. And then he tweeted and said, that's really funny. Why don't you come over here and tell us that joke in person? And I realized I'm about to start tweeting fart jokes to the Taliban. <laughs> and no one should ever do that. So I stopped. But I started getting all these weird threat messages and abuse messages. And it started coming from two groups. One were Islamic extremists in Pakistan. And the other were far-right extremists in Australia. And both of them were saying the same thing. Both of them were saying... The Pakistani Islamic extremists were saying, he's not a refugee because refugees aren't real things. Everything's fine in the country. Um, anyone who goes abroad as a refugee is lying to make the country look bad, and therefore they should die. And the far-right people in Australia were saying, he's not a refugee. Refugees are not a real thing. He's just lying to come to Australia, and anyone who's lying like that should die. And, and I've, here's the thing, I've been working in refugee rights things now for four or five years. I've been in Australia, since I've come to Australia, it's been something I'm passionately involved in. And I, I don't consider myself naive, but I realized that I, it, how trapped refugees are was something I only realized in that moment. Where I was like, not only is the country that you're escaping from hating you for escaping, but the country you're escaping to hates you for trying to escape to it. And that's the situation most refugees and asylum seekers in Australia find themselves in. And, 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 and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And we've got the Pacific Solution, and that's happening. And, and, and then Manus and Nauru. And, and now there's a thing with the Department of Immigration has uh, announced, which, uh, and Border Protect, and sorry, DIBUP, Department of Immigration and Border Protection, um, has said that, that um, refugees and asylum seekers who are in Australia um, from Manus and Nauru who came here for uh, health purposes due to uh, medical treatment and such are no longer going to be receiving um, Centrelink or, or um, legal care or housing care or any of these things. And, and they've, they've been cut off from all financial aid. And that puts them in a, in a very dire situation because now they're going to be rendered ho on homeless. They won't be allowed to work. They won't be allowed to be, be, they won't be given any money. And, and it throws them completely into the deep end. And it's that thing of they haven't suffered enough now there's another indignity heaped upon them, for which organizations like the Red Cross are, are, are needed because they then provide basic services. They provide a basic sense of humanity to people whose, whose own sense of humanity is being shredded from them. And it can seem bleak, I know that, because I've been working on this for so long and you keep thinking nothing's working. We're not changing any opinions. Every time you go online it's, or on the internet or you turn on TV or anything, it's worse. And the things that people are saying is worse and they're more horrific. But something weird happened. Um, like I said, I, I used to do comedy about explaining refugees and asylum seekers and things to people in WA. In small country towns in WA, I'd go across the country um, and it, talk to people about that. And eventually, I started getting d distraught over it because I was like, I'm not changing anyone's mind. So I stopped. And then after moving to Melbourne, I went back to WA because someone booked me for some shows. And I went through those same towns again two years later. And in every small town I went to, literally towns called like Burakopin, population 120, people had signed up for refugee rights groups. People had signed up for asylum seeker groups. People had signed up. They were, they were hosting asylum seeker families in their homes. They were doing everything they could. And, and, and I, was like, I, I got confused. I was like, why are you doing it? What changed your mind? And they said it was the comedy. Because what happens is, I think that things like comedy remind us of our humanity. Because we laugh, when we laugh, it's a human response. And that made them see refugees, asylum seekers as humans in a way that they hadn't before. I think that's very important. 
So as long as we can keep doing that and aspiring for that, it might make a difference in the end. We have an incredible panel um, that I'd like to invite on stage now. Um, and once they're up on stage, I'll introduce all of them. So if you could come and join, please give a big round of applause to the panel that we'll be having a nice conversation with now. Starting all the way from there, that's Francis Deng. Francis is many things, a father, a brother, a son, an employee, and a former refugee. Uh, he joined the Australian Army Reserve for several years and in 2015 joined the Australian African Inclusion Program, which was an initiative led by GSS and NAB, or NAB. Francis continues his role there today as a member in the data analytics and reporting team. Thank you, Francis, for joining us. Seated next to him is Vicky Mao. Vicky is the National Manager of Migration Support Programs and Australian Red Cross, which supports migrants in transition, asylum seekers, people who have been trafficked, held in immigration detention, or have been separated by war, disaster, or migration. Vicky is also co-chair of the Red Cross Asia Pacific Migration Network. Please, thank you so much for coming, Vicky. Also is, and I apologize for the pronunciation, Merid? Merid. Merid. Hanan. Merid is an experienced educator in the field of TESOL, language and multicultural education. Uh, she's currently associate head of campus at St. Joseph's Flexible Learning Center, where she manages a program for 100 asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants. Thank you, Marit. And Lizzie, Lizzie quotes, Lizzie came from South Sudan, and she wants to do her own introduction. So I'll allow Lizzie to take over from there. Thank you. I'm going to share a poem with all of you. Um, so this poem is about my mandong, it means grandma in my language. Mm -hmm. To break the ice, because I'm really nervous, and I'll be sitting here for a while, so bear with me. When I close my eyes, I see a beam of light, the silhouette of a woman. She's the perfect combination of beauty and wisdom. My mandong kindness, the wonder of it is like the way her hands have molded me like architect. Her tender mercies feel like the cool breeze, the morning sunshine. There has never been a day I deny the reason behind the happiness I live. Even after the years that passed, I'm grateful because if not for the sacrifices she has made, I wouldn't be standing here. So I just wanted to acknowledge that through a poem. She showed me many things, but most importantly, how to let my hopes not hurt shape my future. To live darlingly, boldly, and fearlessly. Things in life go in circles. My soul wanders at the moon, the rays of stars. A genius must have designed this. And in a plum-colored night like this, I reminiscent on the past. The smell of the whips and the trumbles lingered in my mind. My head is soaked in fragrance, scented with the saddest memories. Seven years and more. My eyes dance gracefully with a stream of sparks. I could die of grief. I never thought, perhaps one day, my mandong will be far, so far away from me. I long for the hum of her warmth to comfort and inspire my emotional essence, my source of laughter. So uh, I just wanted to introduce myself through this poem because um, uh, my gratitude towards my mother, it's really, I wanted to show it through my actions. And uh, I feel that it's, um, it's my honor that I would be sitting here uh, to um, tell her story, if not mine. So thank you. So let's start with, the, with your story then. Um, and we go through the room um, that way. If you could just kind of tell us just briefly um, about how you came here from South Sudan and, and what your experience was in that journey across. 
Um, so I guess in my lifetime, I've experienced a lot of turmoil and strife. Um, my father, um, actually, when we were just babies, abandoned my abandoned me and my siblings. And mom did her very best to uh, provide for us. So uh, I came from South Sudan. And um, at six, when I was six, maybe younger actually, uh, I witnessed my mom bleed to death. Actually, if she was in Australia, she would have, you know, survived. Um, so that's the kind of um, sort of early memories uh, and life experiences. And um, so when grandmother came to mourn her death, um, you know, she saw the circumstances and decided to sort of, um, yeah, t take me and my siblings in. So I had um, two old, on older siblings who went with my auntie, and two of my younger siblings and I went with our grandmother. So I um, guess um, basically grandmother did her very best to provide for us, our basic need. Uh, I grew up seeing her work hard, and I really admired her strength, and she, um, I mean, I also felt sad because she prevented me from doing the physical work. So I would translate in Arabic. Um, yeah, so she's really, yeah, so I kind of, yeah, and, and in early 2000, and, um, in early 2000, I think 2003, um, through the help of my aunties and uncles, um, uh, my grandmother and my siblings managed to um, escape water, uh, water torn country South Sudan in a truck and basically made our way to Egypt where we stayed for a couple of years till 2000, when in 2005 um, we were granted a visa um, to come to Australia. I had no idea what Australia was like. I've never heard of Australia, uh, only hear of America. So I was disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, but now that I know, obviously I'm, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to, to be here, so yeah. Uh, Francis, just because you, you yourself have also had the experience of being uh, of coming to Australia as a refugee. If you could just quickly take us through your journey of, to getting here. Um, uh, thanks, Sam. I think this is something similar to Lizzie. Um, we both come from South Sudan. Um, it, it was back in late 1980s. Um, the war had started in 1983 in the Sudan, and in the late 1980s, uh, the war came to my village. And um, I was about, I was eight, uh, nine years old at that time. And uh, the rebel group that were operating in the south fighting against the Sudanese government they thought that uh, young boys like myself, 9, 10, the age of 15, they thought that they were vulnerable. In their own wisdom, they thought they were vulnerable. And so they collected us from our villages. Um, I was age 10, I was about 9 then. And they walked us across the desert, across South Sudan to Ethiopia. Uh, that was 19, 1988. And so, we crossed the border into Ethiopia, but again, the Southern Rebel were still operating in Ethiopia as well. So they placed us in a refugee camp where they were controlling the camp. Uh, we were about 30,000 boys up at the age of 10, uh, fending for ourselves. Uh, we were no parents. Um, so for about four or five years, we lived in that camp, controlled by that rebel group. But then there was also political instability in Ethiopia by that time, 1991, I believe. So we fled back to South Sudan. And so we, we are from place to place, fleeing from the enemy. And um, in late 1992, we crossed the border into, into Kenya, um, where UNHCR collected us at the border, I think a place called Lokichogyo, uh, to Kakum, a refugee camp. I think the Red Cross here might be familiar with the, with, with the camp. And so from 1992, for about 10 years, I grew up in that camp. Um, luckily, the, uh, the UN provided basic education 
Um, so we, I gained my primary school education in the camp. Um, I was lucky to, when I finished my primary school, I, I was lucky to, to gain a scholarship by GRS, with the Jesuit Refugee Services. And then they took me to a boarding school uh, in, in the district, which was part of the government school. So four years later, when I finished uh, 2001, the, uh, the, uh, the government of Australia sent send the, send the Minister for Immigration, I believe that it was Philip Braddock. Philip Braddock actually came to the refugee camp. And, um, and we had become known as the, the Lost Boys of Sudan. Um, by that time, the Americans had also come to the camp and said, these boys have suffered for too long. They had been uh, without parents. They are now from childhood into adulthood. Uh, it's good that we help these young boys. So Americans started uh, uh, resettling thousands of boys. Then the Australian government also came to the camp and said we would also love to take some of these boys. So uh, early 2003, I arrived in Australia. Uh, Were you also camp. disappointed that it was in America? Or? No, 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 not at all. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't know much about Australia, but luckily we were reading about Australia and America, Canada in, in, in our history books. Uh, we were lucky in Kenya, English is one of the official languages, so all the syllabuses were in, were in, uh, in English. So I, I knew a bit about Australia. I knew about there was a kangaroo, and, right. and they were saying kangaroo eat, eat people. And so I was, I was scared uh, that I would, I would be eaten by a kangaroo. But, but yeah, I, I was happy. I was happy coming here. Um, I arrived and uh, it, 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 was, it was good. So since you, once you came to Australia, um, what were the resources? Because now we're in a situation where we're seeing resources being stripped away from many refugees and asylum seekers in Australia. What are the resources you found were most helpful for you at the time? Yeah. That were essential, you'd say? Yeah, I, I, I thought because my, my visa was by government. So they, they placed us in, uh, in, um, in a public accommodation that was looked after by my um, migrant resource center, I believed. And they were looking after us. And so for the first two months, uh, we were given cultural orientation, um, um, cultural orientation, uh, banking orientation. Uh, basically, for a month or, 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 or two, uh, giving us awareness about what Australia is and how you would assess um, opportunities, you want to go to school, you want to find work, uh, where you would go. And then, so I, because it was the government, I thought uh, Migrant Resource Center was very helpful in, in, in orienting us, uh, fit in, 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 uh, in here in Australia. So I, I, I thought they were, yeah, they, they, service, they yeah. were helpful. If I just bounce off of that, uh, Myra, you worked, you do work with many asylum seekers and refugees in educational capacities, and he was saying the cultural um, education was very helpful. Is that still a resource that's available, and, and how difficult is that? How challenging is it to, when a migrant comes here or a refugee comes here, um, to teach them about Australian culture and Australian society while also being aware of their own backgrounds? How does that work? Yeah, I think um, classrooms are a great place for negotiating what people want to learn and where people are at and, and who they are. And if you're starting from a point of, I'm just looking at the people in the room, really you're starting from there, let's get to know each other. How do we all work together? And then from there you can talk about how the society works together. So I think really then the onus is on, on how the teacher and the organisation with that leading that space um, uh, allows those people to be who they are and also to be welcomed into Australia. So really that's about a quality of the organisation of the teacher to be able to make that work very well and allow space for people to be who they are and, and negotiate and it. What kind of training is there to, pro to help teachers with that or is it just something you, you have to seek out yourself? I think Australia's always been pretty good with, uh, well since say, say about the 70s, 60s, 70s when teaching and setting up migrant resource centres sort of initiated then. Australia's been quite good at that kind of settlement, along with countries like Canada. Um, so there's space for it in those kind of migrant settings. But I think that what the teacher brings to that classroom is their own experience. And it's not easy just to give people a training package about how to be culturally aware. It's really about 
One understanding that they have a plurality and of the fact that we have many, many languages and many, many cultures here and a long Indigenous history and a whole lot of layers of migration after that. And if teachers really know themselves, they're better equipped to do that more effectively. Uh, Vicky, one of the things you've been working with Red Cross for so long, you've seen, um, and, and many parts of the world as well, you've seen some of the things that work and some of the things that probably don't work or haven't worked in the past. How effective are many of the tools and utilities provided to refugees and asylum seekers in Australia now? What are the things that we're doing right? It's a huge question when you yeah. start to, to unpack it a little bit. I mean, I think what we do right is there is a lot of support and there's a lot of support from organisations, from the sector, from community and from government at a range of levels in terms of really making sure that especially refugees that come into Australia are really well supported and, and oriented to the community in a way that's right for the individual and I think that's really important. Sometimes we talk about groups of refugees or people seeking asylum as groups rather than as individuals that have really particular needs and families that have particular needs as well. Um, so I think in a lot of those areas we're, we're doing it right. I think like you said, um, in a lot of the areas where refugees and people seeking asylum are settling, I think the communities are often doing it right as well. So what we see, um, you know, Red Cross through our membership branches and our volunteers, but also more broadly, we see communities actually really welcome. So I think in the public debate we have a bit of a um, an idea that everyone's at one end of the spectrum around refugees and asylum seekers. And I think we know from experience that when people sit down and actually meet someone with lived experience or hear from them and a panel like this, that their opinions can actually shift. And actually we're all much closer to the middle um, than what we assume at, at the start. So I think the community support and community engagement and community offers of help and welcome. You know, we've got stories, so many stories at Red Cross about um, people really being motivated to pick up extra English language classes because they've been referred to as mate by their neighbour, didn't think that was their name, wanted to check what mate met in, meant in this context. So simple acts of kindness, simple acts of saying hello to your neighbour and stuff like that. Australians are really good at that, we're doing it really well. Um, but I think we've still got a lot of a way to go in terms of having maybe a more sophisticated understanding of how complex this issue is globally, regionally and nationally and really understanding the individuals behind it rather than referring to them as, as groups, if yeah. you like. Um, one of the things I wanted to like, get into a bit is, uh, especially Lizzie, you, you, you came here at a very young age and the amount of time that you've now spent here, um, uh, as Vicky mentioned, that, that you know, people aren't as extreme as you think, they're, they're more in the middle, they're not all refugee hating um, you know, racists or things like that, and nor are they all you know, open arms moving to my house with me, there's some middle ground there, or at least that's, a, that's what we hope. What's, um, what has your experience been? You've been working so long now with different multicultural groups and things like that. Are attitudes in Australia changing for the better, for the worse? Where do you think things are going? Does it work? Yeah, I think so. Uh, okay. um, yeah, cool. Um, I came here um, in 2005, um, so that was a long time ago. Um, Department of um, Education, uh, Human Services, and um, I forgot, God. Um, so I guess when I came, I was given a lot of resources that I've not had all my life. So um, to be able to go to school for me was something that I was really grateful for. And through being educated, I was able to make, um, you know, um, sound decisions uh, in, in the direction that my life was headed. Um, I went to language school and I remember a lot of, and I see a lot of people that I went to language school with. Uh, I came from a country that did not speak English, so I came from Egypt. And so I had to learn English here. And so that was really... Um, was a major struggle for me. But that also motivated me to sort of um, really try. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, a lot of the time for some of the youth that I see uh, who are South Sudanese who are uh, sort of disengaged, I, I kind of think it goes back to um, the pressures that um, are, you know, are sort of imposed on people that come to Australia. So there is a thing where, where when you come here, not only in a new country, which you have to learn a new language, you have to learn new culture, new society, just 
things like the word mate all the way down to the nitty gritties of Australia. Um, I'm, every time I have this thing where I, every time I meet refugees and asylum seekers, it's largely um, in settings like these. And, and I meet people like you and Francis who are exceptional. And I always wonder, like, is there a pressure to be exceptional? Are you allowed to just be um, average or do you have to become role models to prove to Australia that no, look, we will contribute to society well, we will be useful, we will be helpful. Um, is that pressure something you do feel or is it something that you yourself have taken on you, um, upon you? I would say half-half, because -half, yeah. uh, personally I have a, um, a personal drive within me to, to be an agent of change. Um, as well as I do agree that there is uh, a pressure that, um, because unfortunately what media portrays um, it, you know, asylum seekers and refugees are seen as, you know, potential terrorists, criminals. And so I'm always sort of seen in that light. Uh, doesn't matter what I do. I, I always kind of feel that um, sort of, uh, you know, negative vibe. And I think that sometimes can have a, a negative effect on how you feel as a person uh, in being able to sort of contribute and feel a part of a society. So I do think that is a fact, and personally I have experienced that, but I try to not let that sort of push, put me, put me down, and so I don't really think I'm exceptional, but I think um, I sort of just want to do what's best for myself, so yeah. Murad, you, you, you've got students, many of them are refugees and asylum seekers, and do they have a sense of awareness of the biases people might have about them, where the people think that they're terrorists, people think that they're whatever, uh, criminals and such, or do they have the freedom to just be Aussie? Um, I think they're trying to exercise both, um, but I think the pressures are really mounting because um, most of the students I have at the moment are, um, are seeking asylum, so their lives are sort of in the paper daily, like it's every day there's some this little change, that little change, or the threat that a letter will come. I mean, we have to, we actually have like, you know, once a week bring your letters along and we just read them and try and figure out what's going on because it's not easy. So if, if we can't uh, figure it out, imagine how that feels for people when it's actually changing their lives. Um, and on top of that, I think just uh, something that we can all address in all, uh, in all workplaces and all, all facets of Australia is just um, racism in, in all its guises. So it doesn't have to be obvious, but in subtle ways that erodes at people, especially when they're vulnerable due to being stateless and having so little um, idea of what their future will hold. So I think that's something that we could be really vigilant about. Vicky, with organisations like Red Cross, you've been dealing with this for so long now, um, what are the resources that you still feel are needed? What more can be given to a someone like Red Cross to help people? What are you falling short on? Oh, it's on a lot of different levels. So I think, I mean, globally, having seen the work, kind of work we do in the Middle East, but also in the Asia Pacific, this is a really massive, complex issue that for some reason, I think many of us still think can be solved rather than responded to. Um, and so I think one of those things is actually about being, working more closely together internationally. So Red Cross, for example, is now trying to work across all of the countries we're in, so 190 countries of origin, transit, destination, um, and look at the impacts that migration and especially refugee movements have across all of those, and really resourcing a range of issues, whether it's Red Cross or whether it's governments, but actually looking at how you address the issues in the country of origin before people become refugees. How do you actually provide people with hope and safety within their own countries? How do you support people who are travelling through countries of transit where they're trying to find safety but just can't land on it, whether it's because a country hasn't signed the Refugee Convention or because there isn't the support that they might need for their particular issues? And then we've got countries of destination where you know, in many ways, if you come as a refugee, there's a lot of support. In other ways, especially if you come as someone seeking asylum, there's a different range of supports. And, and that's at a, a whole lot of different areas at the moment. So because it, Australia has a thing where, in terms of rankings, we're one of the best in terms of yeah. helping refugees who come here. 
once they've achieved refugee status. But when it comes to dealing with asylum seekers, obviously we're notoriously terrible and horrific. So wh how do you get, fill that disconnect um, with an organisation like Red Cross? Yep. So a good example would be, in many ways, if there is government support, we might run a government-supported program that addresses their needs in the community. But where we have a group of people who aren't eligible for government support, and that includes federal government support, or it might be state government support, things like access to concessions for low-income earners, for example, something really simple like utility concessions or transport concessions that they might not be eligible for in various states across Australia, we'll provide them with support around that. So simply to get the tram for for example, to an interview or, or in a more extreme case, people who aren't eligible for any financial support. Um, Red Cross and a lot of other people in the sector will work really closely together to make sure that their accommodation needs are met, that they've got their f material needs met. So food, you know, simple things like food, school fees or someone who can talk to the school about why that family can't necessarily pay for that excursion fee, for example, um, because the school doesn't understand. So linking, you know, there's, we've recently seen issues around people who are are experiencing domestic violence who might not be able to access government support, who are here on a different kind of visa, um, can't necessarily access a refuge, for example. So we're really reaching out to that group as well to be able to support them uh, from the belief that, that everyone deserves to have their humanitarian needs met, first and foremost, but also that for anyone in that situation who is having to make decisions about their future, they need to feel safe and secure first. So how can we make someone feel safe and secure by making sure that they've not just got a temporary roof over their head, but somewhere to live with their family? How can we make sure that they're not... Um, having to explain to their kids why there's no food on the table and really make sure that first and foremost those humanitarian needs are met and then beyond that what we can do to refer them to all of the support services they might need. But it puts pressure on a lot of services, you know, and I think especially state-based services around increasing issues of things like homelessness um, is an issue we're trying to work on with a range of governments across Australia. So it can be really complex because there's lots of different factors and then we're trying to work with the community to kind of get the community to wrap around that support as well and make sure people are okay. So there's lots of resources at lots of different levels, um, I think, at the moment in terms of really making sure people are supported. Uh, one of the things that's happening with this as well is the uh, entire event is being Facebook live. Um, which means people are watching it on Facebook right now, and they can post their, if you are watching it on Facebook, you can post your questions, I'm not telling you, I'm telling the people on Facebook, there's a camera in the back. Uh, you can post your questions on Facebook, and those will also be um, asked off the panel, because I'd like to now open the floor to the uh, audience as well, who I'm sure has many questions for my panelists here. Uh, if you do, raise your hand. Um, I would ask that it be a question, and uh, many times at events like these, the urge to not ask a question but instead deliver a manifesto <laughs> can be overwhelming. Um, and you know, and, and I'm sure we all have wonderful ones, but you know, let's save those for the for our own events. And over here, let's ask uh, our esteemed panel something more relevant. Anyone? Yep, right there in the corner. Hi there. Um, it seems to me that um, you've talked a bit about public perception and perhaps a gap between how refugees and asylum seekers are often perceived versus, you know, how they how they perhaps should be. And therefore, it's, if it's a problem of public perception, you haven't spoken much about the media and the part that the media plays in this country in particular, and therefore perhaps the way um, our leaders respond to the media as opposed to um, leading. And I just wonder if uh, any of our panellists have anything to say about that. we we'll start from the corner. Francis, um, you've been in Australia now for so long. You've seen the shift in media narratives and everything. Do you feel that the media is shaping things? And, and if so, how can that be affected, do you think? Um, I, I, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I, would say, I would say at times the media would get it right but at times the media um, would get it wrong. Um, I think we have all seen um, I, I witnessed a story back in 2007 um, or sometimes can be lack of understanding of, of cultural background. Um, I'm a Sudanese and mostly Sudanese young men before for coming here, we, they, they work together. Uh, not necessarily that they are a gang, but just the, the, the way, they, yeah, culturally. Um, not all the time. 
So in 2007, I was in a small town called Wollongong in New South Wales, and there was an incident here in, uh, in Melbourne that was involving a uh, young Sudanese male. And the way the media portrayed to me was, was not helpful for all of us as a community. I mean, as a community, not just a Sudanese community. Um, and I was walking to school in the morning and because there was a story last night in the media talking about Sudanese gang, I'm not saying Sudanese are, uh, have not committed anything. The thing is, I witnessed that I'm one of the advocates to try to address what is happening with young people now. Uh, and, and I do believe it's, it's a, a, an issue that needs to be addressed. But sometimes media can, 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 can need to play that critical role in making sure the story is right. Uh, because once it's out in the media, it, it can be taken in a different way. And that can be harmful uh, to even people that were not involved. And so as I was just walking, uh, a couple um, just say words, yell words at me and throw stones at me. And I turned and there was a gentleman coming toward me and said, oh, I apologize for what happened to you. But I knew it was because of what happened last night. Uh, the, the way, whatever broadcast. So I, I can say sometimes media get it right, but sometimes media uh, may get it wrong. And that, and that, and that, um, and yeah, that's, that's what, I can, what I can say to that. Vicky, how has the media um, affected the narratives around uh, refugees and asylum seekers recently? Yeah, I think there's, I mean, it's a great question and we could talk about it much more in terms of that broader sense of media as well. So there's social media, there's the mainstream media. Um, but I think one of the things that I really take away from the role of the media in particular is that idea that you cannot be what you cannot see. So if we've got a whole lot of people in Australia who have come from different backgrounds and we don't have a positive portrayal of those communities in the media, that makes it very difficult for young kids to aspire towards not even being exceptional, just towards being ordinary um, in lots of ways in terms of positive contributions to the community. So I think there's a lack of that in terms of that really kind of public celebration of um, what refugees and people seeking asylum can contribute to our country. But I think really practically, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, we know from our work with um, a range of clients and also through academic studies we're involved in, that every time there's a, a really negative story on the front of the paper, it really impacts people's mental health. It has a very... I mean, it, it happens to everyone, right? If you're already fearful of something and you see a front page of the newspaper talking about it, it makes you fearful. And for people in the community who have been through an extraordinary amount to get here, so whether you come here as a refugee or as someone seeking asylum, you have crossed borders, you have escaped often um, militias, you've encountered violence, you've had to flee from somewhere. Um, and to get to Australia and to finally almost have that ability to feel safe but then feel threatened by, by some of the, the media and some of the debate can be really unsettling and has a direct link um, to their ability to be the resilient individuals that we want who can contribute to our community. So I think on a very personal level, um, some of those, some of that that kind of media that comes out, whether it's the press or whether it's, it's online, can have a very direct and very real impact on their lives. So that would be my biggest concern, I think. Would either of you like to contribute? Yeah. Sure. Um, so uh, media being the news is, is one kind of thing that I think you two have touched on very well, but I think it's also just a matter of is, is Australian life portrayed in film and television enough, you know, and is... Australia in all its diversity there enough. You can't, um, you know, the, the news isn't going to portray good stories of people living harmoniously and loving each other <laughs> very often. They're going to look for problems. So we need, we need the, what it is to be Australian to be very apparent in our, in our dramatic and our artistic and our notion of ourselves. So does that, what, how does that translate? Would that mean a refugee family as a regular cast member on Home and Away and, and Neighbours, or...? Yeah, why not? I mean, right? Home and Away was in the suburbs, and there were always refugees in those suburbs, so there's no reason why it was Lamingtons and White, really. Um, yeah, and so I think that just then plays its way um, through. I mean, we know that racism has been a part of uh, the migrant experience from when my people came out from the potato famine in the 1850s right through to Italians being demonised in Bonagilla and 
right through and, and often it's just the, the next wave is, um, is the next target. And, you know, by now it would be really useful for Australia to drop that approach and just acknowledge that the people in the country are the people in the country and that we're all living together really well. Um, Lizzie, you're young enough to still be on the Snapchat and the Twitter and the Facebook and everything. Like, that's, forgetting the TV and the news, that is also media and that does shape how people believe things and, and react to things. Um, are you seeing a difference between the conversations happening there versus what's on television? Um, absolutely. Um, um, when you go on Facebook and you scroll, you see a lot of negative comments and it really shocks you that people would... Um, feel that way about events and make it general. So it could be about an individual, but the way that people are responding and their comments, uh, they're re directing that comments to the whole of community. So people are m marginalized by that. So I, I could be living in, you know, in Melbourne and something happened in Sydney, but I have a direct you know, I'm sort of blamed for that. And it's, it's really, it's, it's shocking, but at the same time, it's happening. And so really, I would add to what they say, that media, people like us, we, you know, we trust media more than we trust politicians. And I think that's where um, the gap is, because, you know, they, because um, I think, you know, they, we need to sort of set standards that we shouldn't normalize these sort of behaviors where people feel it's okay to, um, you know, to, to be nasty and treat everyone um, with disrespect just for being themselves. So, yeah. Any other questions? Happy to take some more. Hi. Um, I'm Bodhi. Um, so, Frank and Lizzie, you guys are first generation um, immigrants, first, uh, yeah, migrants, same here as well. Um, first generation migrant. I moved here from Nigeria, even though I've lived in the UK and lived in several parts of the world. But what I kind of um, understand is uh, for first generation migrants, you kind of get what it is to adjust to a new um, environment, especially coming from wherever you're coming from, you easily integrate. But it seems like there's a, there's lot, there's, uh, the issue lies with the second generation migrants who were actually born here or maybe born in the country wherever they are, uh, who kind of um, go through uh, maybe identity crisis or something they don't really understand. They don't really belong back home and they don't really belong here. I don't know if you have any understanding about, you know, any um, maybe issues around that, why there seem to be more, you know, levels of delinquency among the second generation migrants who are actually born here. The question, if uh, those who couldn't hear is, the, um there's a difference, seems to be a difference between the first generation migrants and second generation migrants, in that the first generation works hard to settle in, and the second generation, you're saying, sometimes actually reacts badly or has different reactions. Um, it, it's, a, it's something that's come up in the news time and time again. Um, is that something that, uh, starting from you, as a teacher, have you, have you found that? You're dealing with the children of of refugees and asylum seekers as well. Um, are they integrating just as well as other kids who are a generation later? Yes, I think they do. Um, but I don't think you can deny that they have to uh, be able to live in multiple worlds. So they need to be able to live in the Australia of school, the Australia of their parents and their parents' community, which is which who migrated and then also be able to negotiate possibly the country they came from. So there's at least three sorts of groups they need to be able to work in very effectively, and that's not easy. It's conflicting your values, your cultural beliefs, um, and also questioning who you decide you really want to be. And in that, you have to find uh, a lot of strength in yourself to decide that and, and if you're only going to be the one person in each place, you really have to make that a firm decision or you're going to be a person who changes a little bit and adapts to each place, you know, so each it's, it's fraught, right. yeah. But on top of that, if you're facing um, discrimination because of your skin colour or the language you speak or the accent you happen to have or where you live or your gender or whatever else, well, then you also have that to combat. So I think you're looking at multiple sort of weights that people have to bear and it sort of depends on their circumstance whether they can come through that or not.
Francis, you're a first generation migrant. Uh, is there a second generation already or? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. There as in, as in uh, do you personally have a, a second generation? No, uh, I'm just uh, <laughs> double check. No. Oh, I, I thought it was like a, oh, no, Only no. because my, my, my question being like you are South, Sudan, South Sudanese and now Australian. And is there for you any confusion about which identity is where? Or is, are you, no. do you feel comfortable about those? No, no, as for myself, I, I am comfortable. Um, what about the kids that you then meet who are now second generation? Do you I, think yeah, they're comfortable? I, yes, um, I think that's, that's where the problem is. And to write to the question. Um, personally, I understand uh, when I first arrived here as an adult, uh, I know it was a privilege for me. Um, coming here and knowing there are educational opportunities, employment opportunities that I didn't have in my, in my country of origin. Um, uh, not only education or employment, uh, insecurity was a big, big problem, shelter. So coming here, whatever happened here, for me, I resolved, it, it, it was not going to affect me. Uh, whatever, whether it's negativity or positivity, I would absorb it and reflect on where I came from. I think that's where the problem is with the second generation of, of young people in this country who came here either very, very young or they were born here. And as, as, as you mentioned, is, uh, we don't know what is happening in school, in the, school, in, in, in the playground. And, uh, they're calling names, um, are they being called names? Or, uh, and, and how these young, mostly young boys, teenagers, are, are, are reacting in a way we sometimes see in the media, in, in the news. Um, and so we, as a community, is something we are also working on that and try to address. And, uh, I have a three-year-old now, and uh, um, I just want to work very hard. And you know, when, when she becomes a teenager, is somebody that would appreciate where you know, their parents came from and uh, where they are and, and the privilege they have, be, they have been accorded that it's not you know, what people are looking for. So I, I think, as uh, you rightly mentioned, is there's something with, with, I don't know, by who or names calling in schools or because of who you are or where you come from. Something is affecting believe. them, yeah. Something is happening. And I think as a community, as a society, uh, it, it, it has to be addressed in some way or another. Um, we have a question on Facebook, so I'll take this one. It's probably going to be our last one, so very quickly just going across the panel. Um, starting with you, Lizzie. The question is from Adam, um, and it is, what's the kindest act you've ever witnessed in the Australian community? It's a big one, can I? Yeah, all right, you can pass it on. And then <laughs> oh, look, I've witnessed very many, I think I have to say. Um, I just get amazed at uh, working with people who are newly arrived in Australia, uh, always by their gratitude and resilience and hope. And I also get amazed by how many people are willing to say welcome and how many sorts of organisations are willing to set themselves up to say welcome. So examples of that would be um, the huddle where I used to work, which is part of the North Melbourne Football Club, um, the community arm of that, which basically said we welcome uh, migrants and refugees. Um, and now where I work at St Joseph's Flexible Learning Centre, which is a school in North Melbourne, um, it's removed any barriers for asylum seekers so they're able to come to school, they don't need money, they don't need a Mikey, we give them all those things. So it's really um, the generosity of the Edmund Rice Education Australia that has enabled them to access schooling and not just be at home waiting and waiting for visa changes. Um, so I think there's a great acts of kindness and hope. Yeah, I mean, we've got um, thousands of volunteers across the country who reach out every day to support by training people um, in particular areas of work, by teaching English, by looking after kids, by mentoring. Um, and all of our volunteers and our members groups, I mean, they do that. It's like with every other organisation. They do it out of the goodness of their heart. Um, and that is matched by the kindness of... Um, people who come to Australia as newly arrived migrants and especially my, uh, refugees and asylum seekers who constantly share their story to educate and including on the panel here, I think that's the ultimate spirit of generosity because by hearing those stories, we understand those stories and Australians change their attitude and it can never be easy to tell your stories over and over again and it's never often easy to hear them either but it's so critical that I think actually that's the ultimate 
kindness is the sharing of that story so that we can become a stronger and a better nation that appreciates diversity. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think overwhelmingly uh, this is a great country. Um, 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 Australians are great people. I, I truly believe that. Um, I've experienced myself. I am what I am today because of the compassion and generosity of this country. Um, uh, but some, sometimes what happens is that so pockets of negativity irritate some other people more than the, the positive part of it. And I think uh, it seems like it's, it's a natural tendency of, of human beings. Uh, if, if something, something is more negative happens to you, you, you tend to ignore uh, the bigger picture. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, compared to what? This, this country for me, and this is a story uh, we are sharing in the community now to our young people, is that don't forget where you, where you come from. Uh, it is, it's, um, um, whatever happened to you, there will be a, a platform, a place to address that. And uh, you, you have to ask yourself, where did you come from? Or where did your parents come from? And, and I think that's, that's a bigger, bigger story. Uh, uh, this country is great, and it's great for all of us, although there are those elements that, that sometimes irritate other people. So. Um, I guess my, um, um, my, what was the question? Yeah, what's the kindness you've experienced? Yeah, um, so the kindness, um, yeah. Um, so today when I came here, I remembered that um, I didn't remind my friend that the event is starting, and so I texted her, like, when it was just about to start, and she was like, you know, telling me now, seriously? And because she lives um, in Barron's, uh, um, she lives in, uh, somewhere in the city. And so she made it here, and I don't know, I've been scanning the audience to see if she's here, but, Kate! <laughs> there you go. Yes, yeah, so I think she's the kindest person, and everything she does is an act of kindness, so yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Lizzie, Mirad, um, Vicky, and Francis, thank you so much for coming out and sharing your stories with us. And thank you so much to the audience for being so wonderful and, and your questions were pertinent. And more importantly, you were great listeners. So thank you for the Red Cross for hosting this event. Have a good night, everyone.